Welcome to lecture 10 of module 7. This is our last lecture in module 7. We're going to be talking about hydrogen using a rather unique way of solving it using a Cartesian factorization. We're going to find working this way is actually a helpful way in establishing the momentum space wave function for hydrogen. The original idea for this factorization came in 1984 when people were looking at what is called supersymmetric quantum mechanics. The actual solution that I'm going to show parts of it for you today is something that I worked out only within the last year and a half or so. Uh, we're still working on writing it up as a paper and getting it published. So we're going to be solving hydrogen without angular momentum. And it almost seems like that's an odd thing to do. I have a central force problem. Angular momentum is conserved. Why in the world would I solve it without using angular momentum? Well, this allows us to work in the Cartesian basis, but it also brings up some of the interesting things that happen when we do factorization for a more complicated system. And in this case, what we have is we have the sum of three A dagger A terms, one for each spatial direction, X, Y, and Z. Now that's similar to what we had in the simple harmonic oscillator where we also have the sum of three A dagger A operators. But the big difference here is that these operators actually do not commute with each other. And because of that, the whole procedure, all of those operators are coupled to each other, and the whole procedure gets quite a bit more complicated to figure out exactly how to solve it. So I would like to say that this strategy is interesting, uh, this technique is interesting because of the strategy that it uses. And it also gives us a clear approach for how to get momentum space wave functions, although I will admit that the procedure does require a lot of French cooking-like calculations. So we're going to have a few of those that we're going to see. And I'm going to be suppressing some of the most technical things so you don't have to worry about going through those. We are going to solve explicitly for the 1s wave function in momentum space using this. And the reason why that's very important is there actually is an experiment that measures the 1s wave function of hydrogen in momentum space. That experiment is called electron momentum spectroscopy, and we're going to talk about that during the class time that we have associated with this lecture. So we have to start off with these objects that are called harmonic polynomials. We have to work with these when we are not working with spherical harmonics. And the idea of approaching spherical harmonics using harmonic polynomials was originally due to Hans Kramers, who you're going to meet in the problem set. And it recently has been redone by Steven Weinberg in his quantum mechanics textbook. So there's an alternative way that you can deal with angular momentum by working with these so-called harmonic polynomials. Well, what are they? They're homogeneous polynomials. That means the order when I add up the exponents of Rx, Ry, and Rz in each term of the polynomial, all of those total exponents are the same. So I can have a quadratic polynomial where the sum is always the squares. I can have a cubic where it's always the cubic and so forth. Now, if you remember that a commutator with a momentum operator is kind of like taking a derivative with respect to the position operator, the corresponding position operator, look at what happens when I look at Rx px commutator with this harmonic polynomial. Obviously, the rx commutes, so it's really rx times the commutator of px with that, Hamil with that uh, polynomial, but px is going to act like a derivative. It's going to pull down a number which corresponds to the power of rx, but then it's going to reduce the number of rx's by one, but then I multiply by rx, so I bring it back out. So that commutator Aside from the minus i h bar, it actually counts the total power of position operators in the polynomial. And if they are all the same, in this case we're saying they're equal to L, then we say we have a harmonic polynomial of order L. And we denote that P L H of R X, R Y, and R Z. So all that this commutator is, and you can see that that operation, R X, P X plus R Y, P Y plus R Z, P Z, when it's put inside the commutator is the equivalent of taking the commutator of R times the radial momentum 
commutator with PL uh, harmonic, the harmonic, the ELF harmonic or uh, polynomial. Okay, it, harmonic, however, comes from the fact that it also satisfies Laplace's equation. And that is written typically as del squared acting on the function is equal to zero. But we want to write that in terms of operators. And the equivalent in terms of operators, which I'll let you think about, is to write it as sum over al alpha nested commutator of P alpha with the commutator of P alpha with the harmonic polynomial and setting that whole thing to zero. Anything that satisfies Laplace's equation will also satisfy this operator equation. They are completely equivalent. So our harmonic polynomials will satisfy these two equations. What are some examples? Well, the number one, that's a zeroth order polynomial. You can plug that into the two different commutators and you will get that it satisfies that, satisfies it with L equals zero. The simple operators Rx, Ry, Rz, that will satisfy it. The operators Rx squared minus Ry squared, Rx, Ry, Ry, Rz, Rz, Rx, or R squared minus three, Rz squared, which can be written as Rx squared plus Ry squared minus two Rz squared. You can see that those are all homogeneous polynomials of zeroth, first, or second order. But more importantly, if you look at del squared acting on them, you will find that they're zero. Let's look at the last one. The second derivative with respect to x of that polynomial is just going to be 2 because I will get a, the first derivative will, will give me 2rx and then the second derivative will just give me 2. Similarly, the second derivative with respect to R y or with respect to y is going to give me two and the second derivative with respect to R z is going to give me two. So when I evaluate that I will get two plus two minus two times two which is zero. So that satisfies this operator equation and you can also work it out by carefully working through those commutators if you like and that is why we say that this is a harmonic polynomial because it satisfies this Laplace equation. Okay, the other thing to point out is that these objects have definite angular momentum L, which is fixed in each polynomial, but they actually mix together different values of M. And so these are not the same as YLMs, but of course that chemistry version of looking at the Cartesian spherical harmonics, you can rewrite the Cartesian spherical harmonics in terms of these harmonic polynomials. All right, as I mentioned, this Cartesian factorization originated in 1984. We're going to factorize the Hamiltonian, which we're going to write in Cartesian form. So it's sum over alpha P alpha squared over 2M minus E squared over R. We're going to write it as the sum over alpha A dagger alpha A alpha plus A uh, energy, which we're going to call E1. We're going to be working with ladder operators and I'm telling you what the answer is for the ladder operator. It's 1 over square root of 2m p alpha minus i h bar over a0 r alpha over r and the energy is minus e squared over 2a0. You should recognize that that's the ground state energy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually generalize this to something that we're going to call h of lambda which has a 1 over lambda multiplying the potential term. And we're going to modify the ladder operators to put that lambda in there. And then the energy becomes minus e squared over 2a0 lambda squared. I'm going to actually prove it for general lambda. And of course, lambda equals 1 corresponds to the ground state of hydrogen. So let's get on with the proof. We have to calculate a dagger a and see what we get. Of course, we're going to get the 1 over 2m. We're going to get the p alpha squared. We have to look at the constants in front. We'll get a minus i h bar over lambda a0, the commutator of p alpha with r alpha over r. And then we're going to get plus h bar squared over lambda squared a0 squared r alpha squared over r squared. That comes from the square term. Now look at that commutator. We're going to use the Leibniz rule to separate out. So we have a commutator of p alpha with r alpha. That just gives me a minus i h bar. We're going to have the commutator of p alpha with 1 over r. We've worked out that commutator in the past. And that's going to just equal i h bar r alpha over r cubed. And so we can plug those two results in. The first one term, the minus h bar squared over lambda a zero r hat, that comes from the commutator with the r alpha in the numerator. And the h bar squared r alpha squared over lambda a zero r cubed, that is the one that's coming from the commutator of the one over r. Now, we want to take this and sum it over alpha because that's what we are trying to construct the Hamiltonian 
with respect to, and then we want to add a constant to it to get it to equal the Hamiltonian. So let's go ahead and all I've done here is a simple simplification by it. We're going to multiply in that 2m and we're going to do some simplifications with the a zeros. Remember that a zero is equal to h bar squared over m e squared. So h bar squared over m a zero can be replaced by e squared. And so we're going to do that kind of a simplification and simplify it in terms of those e squareds. And there you have it. We have it now in the form that we're going to put into the summation. Remember, we have to do a summation over alpha. And you can see, looking at it at this stage, there's no constant in here. So it doesn't necessarily even look like this is working to give me the correct factorization. But you're going to see a miracle happen in just a second. When we sum over alpha, of course, the first term will give me uh, the kinetic energy, the sum over alpha p alpha squared over 2m. The second term is going to just be multiplied by a 3 because I have it. I have to sum over alpha equals x, y, and z. The next term, I'm going to get a sum over alpha of r alpha squared. Well, that just gives me r squared. That's going to cancel a 1, o 1 over r squared in the denominator, and I'll be left with a 1 over r there. And similarly, the last term, if I sum that, I get an r squared in the numerator. That cancels the r squared in the denominator, and that's going to actually become a constant. So let's go ahead and do that summation. And when we do the summation, you see we get that factor of 3. And we get the constant at the end. Of course, the minus 3 halves plus a half, that just gives me minus 1. And lo and behold, when I add the constant, you see what that constant term is. I have to add minus e squared over 2 lambda squared a 0. When I add that constant, indeed, we get this form that h of lambda can be written as, I'm sorry, there should be a sum over alpha in that. Sum over alpha a dagger alpha of lambda a alpha of lambda plus e lambda. And then it's written correctly in the next term with the sum over alpha to p alpha squared minus the e squared over lambda r. And then the e lambda is this minus e squared over 2a0 lambda squared. OK, so we're doing good with this. Now, the subsidiary condition that we have is, of course, that a alpha of lambda f on phi lambda is equal to 0. We have that for every alpha. So it's actually three subsidiary equations that correspond to p alpha acting on phi lambda equals i h bar over lambda a r alpha over r phi lambda. OK, the ground state of hydrogen is the case where lambda is equal to 1. And so that actually is now solving for the ground state. The full derivation to get the wave functions and so forth is technical and long, even the eigenfunctions. And so I'm only going to sketch it here. And I'm going to try and go a little bit quickly through this so that we don't take too much time. The first thing we do is we recognize that we want to do something like separation of variables. So I want to take that Cartesian kinetic energy and rewrite it as a radial kinetic energy plus some perpendicular kinetic energy. Now, of course, we know that perpendicular kinetic energy is really just the angular kinetic energy. But I'm going to just do it by the add one trick. I'm going to essentially add the radial momentum piece, and I'm going to subtract the radial momentum piece. And then I'm going to gather together the Cartesian kinetic energy minus the radial momentum, and I'll call that the perpendicular kinetic energy. Now, what happens when that perpendicular kinetic energy acts on one of these harmonic polynomials? Well, it turns out it just is equal to h bar squared l times l plus 1 over 2m r squared. Now, you might be able to immediately recognize that recognizing separation of variables because we know that the operator t perpendicular is indeed proportional to the total l squared divided by 2m r squared. And when the total l squared acts on an definite eigenstate with angular momentum L, it will give h bar squared L times L plus 1. And this is essentially confirming what we had said before, that the harmonic polynomials of order L have angular momentum L. Now what this means, though, and the way that we're going to use it is that t perpendicular minus h bar squared L, L plus 1 over 2m r squared will annihilate this state. And remember, as I had mentioned many times, whenever we get an operator that annihilates a state, we can do interesting things with that. And this is no exception to that. And here I'm just reminding you of the fact that this perpendicular kinetic energy is really proportional to the angular momentum. And it's really the angular kinet contributions to the kinetic energy. And so this is verifying for us that the angular momentum of the harmonic polynomial acting on this state phi lambda has angular momentum L. And notice that the angular momentum is carried entirely by the harmonic polynomial. It works for any phi lambda. Okay. We have to work out an intertwining relationship. It turns out to be much more complicated than the one that we worked out in the past. 
and as I said before, we're only going to sketch the details. We are going to define the same kind of radial operators as we had before, 1 over square root of 2m pr minus i h bar 1 over lambda plus 1 a0 minus lambda plus 1 over r hat. And then what we find is if we compute the b dagger b, you know, this is a calculation we already did. We get pr squared over 2m h bar squared l times l plus 1 over 2m r squared minus e squared over r. And indeed, it's e squared over r, not e squared over lambda r when we do that. And then if we do it in the opposite order, we're going to get a term where the l goes to l plus 1. Otherwise, everything the same. And from those operator relationships, we can actually construct our original Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian with lambda equals 1. But we can construct it in terms of any of those b dagger b's for any lambda. We just take the b dagger b for any lambda, we add the t perpendicular, and we subtract this angular momentum contribution, and we add this constant, this e lambda, and then it's actually equal to the original Cartesian Hamiltonian. You can take a look back and see what happens when we look at that. You can see that we're adding the t perpendicular operator. That then, combined with the pr squared, will give us the total kinetic energy. We're subtracting the h bar squared l times l plus 1 term. And of course, you see we have this e squared over r squared term. So it, it definitely does work. OK? Now, I'm going to keep those relations up. And then we're going to look at the commutator for intertwining of this operator, the t perpendicular minus the h bar squared l times l plus 1, et cetera, with the raising operator, the b dagger r of lambda. You can just work out the commutator because the only thing that I have to worry about in the commutator is the PR term in that B dagger. It has a 1 over square root of 2m. The PR, when it commutes, it's going to actually give me a factor of minus 2i over h bar because each of those contributions has a um, 1 over r squared, if you like, in it. And when all the dust settles, you have to actually work out the commutator, but you get that it just multiplies by this 2i over h bar squared of 2m r hat. Now what we do is we take the second half of the commutator and put it on the right-hand side. And what we see is we can interpret this as like an intertwining operation for this operator. When I try to move a b dagger r to the left through this operator, it shifts the b dagger by this, op by this object, minus 2i h bar over square root of 2m r hat. Okay, that's an important thing to remember. So I'm just summarizing that for you. If we move that operator through a B dagger, it shifts the B dagger by a amount that is actually an operator. It's not just a number. Now, the claim is that this object is an energy eigenstate. It's a string of B daggers that we're familiar with. Then we have an R hat to the N minus L minus 1 multiplying this PL, uh, this harmonic polynomial. If I take the harmonic polynomial and I divide it by r to the l, that harmonic polynomial just has angular dependence to it. That's something that is also a useful fact to know. So how are we going to do that? We have to do essentially an intertwining. And yes, look, it's a horrible mess. But what we're going to do is we're going to act the h. We're acting the, the original Hamiltonian h on this string of b operators. Now, because I can rewrite that h in terms of b dagger r of l, br of l, because remember that identity we, we worked out worked for any lambda. I can then write it essentially as an hl plus some correction terms. And then I can do the normal moving it through. But those correction terms actually give us extra constants that we have to take into account. And that's why I have that summation term that is present. Then in addition, when the I will have a term that goes like a t perpendicular minus this h bar squared l times l plus 1 term. When that goes through all the B dagger operators, it shifts them. And so I get this extra contribution. And then there's even an extra term that's left over that is the string of the B. I have to subtract a string of the Bs because that was the contribution that is appearing in the upper part. That's already present there, and I don't want to double count that. And But the important thing is that it's multiplied by this t perpendicular minus h bar squared l times l plus 1 over 2m r squared. Because remember this identity. That object just depends on, does not have anything that takes derivatives with respect to r, so it can move through the r hat operator. And when it acts on that PL state, we already said that that gives 0. So that gives 0 when it acts on this state. And I can get rid of this ugly piece in the intertwining. Now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at this summation term. So it's just a summation 
from j equals one to n minus l minus one, the term with the n, that's just n times the number of elements in the sum. The term that's the sum with the minus j, that's just the sum of the first integers. We know that's equal to n minus l minus one times n minus l minus one plus one. And that's what is equal to there. We then just do some multiplication and simplify this. And we find that it's equal to one half n plus l times n minus l minus one. We can do some additional, so you can see that here because it has a common factor of n minus l minus one. So I have an n minus one half n minus l, and that just becomes one half n plus l. So that's what's appearing here. We can multiply this out, and you see we can rewrite it as n times n minus one minus l times l plus one. And so we're gonna plug that into the expression above, and that's given by the bottom line. And now we're gonna recognize that we have again this t perpendicular minus h bar squared l times l plus one. We have that acting on this state, that's gonna give a zero, so that goes away, we can get rid of it. And now what we have to do is we have to recognize that this object here will commute with the object that we are looking at, we're gonna bring it through And then that operator is going to act on the state phi n, and it's an eigenstate of this object because we can rewrite this in terms of the B dagger of n, and um, or we can just rewrite the PR squared in terms of the kinetic energy and uh, act that onto this state. No matter how you look at it, this ends up being an eigenstate of this object. And I actually think there's a typo here. When we bring this through, the PR squared is going to act on that r hat to the n minus one. It doesn't act on the PL over L, I can just pull that out, but the r hat to the n minus one, I have to commute it through that. And when I commute it through that, I do get a modification of that h bar squared n times n minus one. I think it becomes n times n plus one. And then that's exactly what I need for this to be an eigenstate because this is an auxiliary Hamiltonian eigenstate. And the, eigen, the energy eigenvalue of that object is just equal to En. And so the en is a number, I can bring it out to the other side, and indeed you see that we do have this eigenstate relationship. So again, I just wanna remind you that there's a small typo here, and uh, we have to uh, recognize that uh, this will be an eigenfunction, eigenstate eigenvalue relationship when we work that through. Okay, so we've gotten it to this, so we have established that it's an eigenstate and the energy is en. And that's the important result that we have determined from doing this calculation. Now we have to, we wanna look at the wave functions. Now remember, we already worked on the string of the B operators acting on these objects. We can uh, actually pull out and rewrite that product of the B operators in terms of a Laguerre polynomial. It's essentially exactly the same algebra that we have done before. It becomes a Laguerre polynomial operator times a constant. And then when we evaluate that against the position eigenstate, we replace the operator by just a function of R. So we get that Laguerre polynomial getting pulled out. And then we're left with the auxiliary Hamiltonian ground state that we have to evaluate. And that involves this Rx, Ry, Rz times the phi n. <coughs> I'm not gonna show you the details of it, but it really all just follows simply from what we've already done before. What I wanna focus on is, let's look at the momentum state wave function. So in this case, we're gonna only work on the ground state momentum state wave functions. It turns out it's a lot harder to do the momentum state wave functions. So I'm only gonna take you through the details of doing one of these, although you're gonna have an opportunity to calculate the L equals one states on the homework. The general case can be done, but it really is a very, very long calculation and I'm not gonna pull you through that. Uh, we're gonna work on the ground state only here in this work. And the challenge, of course, as we always have when we evaluate the momentum eigenstates is that we don't know how to operate position operators against the momentum eigenstates. But the momentum eigenstate is just that momentum bra acting on the state phi one. And the way that we're gonna determine it is to use the translation operator. We're gonna translate the momentum, that's gonna bring in the position operators in the exponential form, as we've done before. We're doing it in the Cartesian representation, so there's no radial operators that we're worrying about here. We're just doing a Cartesian translation here. And then we expand it in a power series, and we have this 
expectation value that we have to evaluate with this product of p times r is raised to the nth power. That is really a complicated expression because it has those sums raised to the nth power. There's a lot of terms there. We're going to actually show you exactly what they are, but it's a complicated expression. Uh, we need to work with the subsidiary condition in order to make this work. It says whenever r alpha over r hat acts on this state, it's equal to p alpha times this state with some constants. And we're going to first focus on showing you how we do this for n equals 1. So n equals 1, we just have pxrx plus pyry plus pzrz. So that's a relatively simple expression. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply the subsidiary equation by r hat from the left. And then we can replace r hat acting on phi alpha by an expression that involves the r hat operator and the p alpha operator acting on phi 1. So you see there's a constant that we pull out in front. That's the A0 over IH bar. You can see there's an R hat that we pulled out to the left. And then we have the number PX times the operator PX plus the number PY times the operator PY plus the number PZ times the operator PZ. And the next thing that we have to do is you have to recognize, look, PX acting on the origin, that gives zero. So I can do an add zero trick and I can replace that with a commutator. I also can pull out all of the PX terms because those are numbers. So I'm going to pull out each of the px, py, and pz terms, and I'm going to have a commutator that is left. We know how to evaluate the commutator of a Cartesian momentum operator with the radial position operator. We just get a contribution of an ih bar. Uh, I believe it's a minus ih bar in the way that it was worked out there times an rx over r hat. And now we're going to use our subsidiary condition again. Now you see we have an rx over r hat, so we can replace that just by the p's times a constant. So we're going to go ahead and replace that by these p operators times the constants, and now we're going to operate those p operators to the left. But you see they're acting on the origin state, and remember they annihilate the state. Again, this is this idea that when an operator annihilates a state, we can use that to simplify expressions. So they're all zero, and that's it. That shows that when n equals 1, the thing is 0. Indeed, we're going to find out that every odd power ends up being 0. So there are no odd power contributions to this summation that we get when we do the translation. But we have to work that out. We have to look at the general case. So let's go ahead and write that out as this sum raised to the nth power. I'm going to explicitly write out what that sum is. And then I'm going to just do n copies of the sum with different indices, which is, of course, the same thing. I'm going to pull the summations and the numbers out, leaving just the operators behind. And now we're going to play the same thing. We have an r alpha n acting on phi 1. We're going to use the subsidiary condition to replace that by an r hat operator times a p alpha operator and some constants. I pull the constants out front. There you see the r hat p alpha. I'm going to do the add 0 and convert that to a commutator, but it's now a commutator with that whole product. Now let's think about what happens with the commutator. So remember, I have a sum over all of these alpha 1s, alpha 2s, etc. P alpha is equal to something. It's either Px, Py, or Pz, and there's always an Rx, Ry, or Rz in each one of those summations. So I'm going to match my Px with an Rx when, say, alpha 1 is equal to x, and that commutator is just ih bar. Okay, so for all of those guys, what's going to happen is I'm going to remove one of the R operators from the summation, and I'm going to set that index equal to alpha n. So I'm going to be taking an alpha 1, setting it to alpha n, or an alpha 2, setting it to alpha n, and so forth, and that's going to affect the p alpha numbers that are out in front to the left-hand side. And then I also have a commutator of a p alpha with an R. That is going to give me a contribution that involves the r alpha over r hat, and of course an I, a minus ih bar I think is what's going to come out from that, or maybe it's plus ih bar in this, in this case. In any case, we have two contributions to the commutator, so I'm going to group those two terms. The first one are the Cartesian ones. All of the contributions are the same when I redefine the dummy indices that I'm summing over. There are n minus one of them, and because I have set the alpha n equal to one of those alpha m's where m does not equal n, and I still have a summation left over from that, I'm going to actually pull out a p vector squared of those numbers. And then I'm left with a product that has only r operators going up to alpha n minus 2. And of course, I have this r alpha n over r hat left as well. Okay. Now, 
we're going to do two tricks here. The first thing we're going to be focusing in is on is that r hat term. I'm going to write the r hat term as r hat squared divided by r hat. And then I'm going to take the r hat squared and write it in terms of its Cartesian components. So I'm going to write it as the sum of r alpha n squared over r hat. And now I'm going to look at, I'm going to rewrite each of those terms. I'm going to write as an r alpha n minus 1 divided r hat times an r alpha n minus 1, which I'm going to put on the left-hand side. And then the r alpha n minus 1 over r hat, I'm going to use our subsidiary condition to replace that with a p alpha. And you see I can do the same thing on the lower term, replace that r alpha to the n over r hat with the p alpha. So we go ahead and do that. There, of course, are some constants that I'm collecting out in front. And again, I can replace this now with a commutator. So I'm going to replace it with a commutator. And now we have a nice simplification because in both cases, we only have the commutator of the Cartesian terms. But we have to be careful with the counting. So now if I do the counting for all in the first set with all of the R alphas up to alpha n minus 2, I just get one contribution. There are n minus two of those contributions. They're all going to give me an ih bar, and there's going to be a delta function with the index. When I do it for the last term, I'm going to have a px commutator with an rx, a py with an ry, and a pz with an rz, something over all of those. I actually get three times ih bar for that contribution. And then when I look at the lower term, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get just the n minus one, and I'm going to remove one of the r alphas, and I'm going to have a delta function with an alpha m with that alpha n, and so I'm going to end up getting a p squared when I do the summation. So it's going to turn out. So there you can see I have the n minus 2 plus 3, and then the last term is actually exactly the same as the term above, so I can combine the two together. And when all the dust settles there, you see I have n minus 1 times n plus 2. That's because I have n minus 2 plus 3 plus 1, and that is equal to n plus 2. And what have I done? You see, this we started out with an expectation value with the r hats raised to the nth power, and now I have it related to the r hats raised to the n minus 2 power. So I'm going to, you see, I can just bring all those summations back in, and it's raised to the n minus 2 power. And so you see, this is a recurrence relation. So I just have to repeat the recurrence relation. I can now change the n minus 2 into an n minus 4. Okay, by bringing in the extra factors. And I can keep doing that all the way down until I get to n equals 1 or I get to n equals 0. If I get to n equals 1, we know that expectation value is 0. So that proves that all odd powers vanish and are 0. If I get down to 0, I have the overlap of the origin of momentum space with the phi 1. That's just some number. I have to keep that around. But you can see these constants in the front, they're actually going to lead to giving me an n factorial times an n plus 2. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to recognize that it's only the even ones that contribute. So I'm going to substitute n goes to 2n. And when I do that, you see I'm going to get an a0 p squared raised to the nth power. I'm going to get a 2n factorial and a 2n plus 2 times this constant. And all the odd contributions vanish. So now we just substitute this into the summation. Remember, we were doing the summation. We were trying to calculate all these terms that go in the summation. So we just substitute into the summation. And the miracle is because only the terms in that summation, I have to let n go to 2n as well. So the minus 1 to the 2n, that's 1. I have a 1 over 2n factorial. That'll cancel with the 2n factorial I have from the evaluation of the matrix element. I'll get an i to the 2n. That becomes minus 1 to the n. And I'll get an h bar to the 2n. So what you see is I'm going to get a sum n equals 0 to infinity of a minus 1 to the n and a0 squared p squared over h bar squared raised to the n multiplied by a 2n plus 2. Now, you may or may not recognize this, but this is very closely related to the geometric series. It's actually the derivative of the geometric series multiplied by 2. So what I can do is I can evaluate this by evaluating the geometric series, multiply, taking its derivative and multiplying it by 2, and then substituting in this argument of the geometric series into it, and that's what you get. And then the final thing I have to do is evaluate that constant and there it is, that's the normalization constant, and this is the ground state wave function. For those of you that have heard of a Lorentzian before, this ground state wave function is the square of a Lorentzian. The argument of the Lorentzian is A0P over H bar, and so we have the square of the Lorentzian for the wave function. In order to find the probability distribution, I would have to square this, then I would get the 
quartic of a Lorentzian, and of course it has a number out front that multiplies it. So I know that this was complicated, long, and kind of torturous. You actually can carry this out to calculate all of the different terms, and you are going to have a, two homework exercises where you're going to look at calculating these wave functions, where you have to go a little bit beyond what we have done with evaluating these expectation values of the products of these Rx's in order to work out what the summation is. But I'm going to carefully sh give you details about how you do that. So I'm going to help you do that. We actually do that by working out some additional recurrence relations that make our work easier to allow us to be able to, to carry out that calculation. We've now reached the end of lecture 10 of module 7. This was a bit of a long lecture. I'm sorry about that, but it simply it was. And I do want to uh, also let you know that this is the end of Module 7. We're going to move on to Module 8 with our next lecture. And with that, we're going to be looking at some approximations. We're going to be looking at perturbation theory in two approximations. We're going to be looking at first order and second order perturbation theory. And we're going to be applying both problems to hydrogen. We'll be looking at radio astronomy and the applications of hydrogen to radio astronomy. And we're going to show you how you measure the size of the proton by just looking at the light that comes out of transitions from hydrogen. So it's going to be pretty interesting stuff. Hydrogen is still on the agenda as we go through those approximations. And that then takes us to the end of this lecture and the end of module 7.